Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Caruso. Welcome to my channel where you learn how to get hired and thrive in the film industry. If you're new here, please be sure to subscribe. Yeah, thank you for having me. My name's Justin O'Neill Miller and I'm a writer and director and I know Michelle, um, there's several um, art department jobs. I think me as an art director in most of those situations and, and Michelle's art department coordinator. And um, yeah, so we've been kind of keeping in touch with each other's careers along the way. And um, we worked together on Trial by Fire and Baby Driver and maybe something else. Maybe not. Feels well, like there met, should be something else. We met on um, Let's Be Cops. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which was a pretty short stint for me. But it. Um, but yeah, that was our that was where we met. Okay. So that must be the third one. Okay. And, um, and yeah, so through, through that whole period, pretty much I've, um, I came into the art department by way of architecture and, um, and, and through set design and, and ultimately art directing. And so I've recently been art directing on some projects like, uh, the outsider on HBO and Tenet and, uh, first man. And um, so I've, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, I've been doing kind of like, it feels like I get, I get handed spaceships and um, boats and planes and stuff a lot lately. So that's cool. I'd like all that stuff. And it, and it um, helps uh, me lean into some of my engineering portion of my architecture education at Georgia Tech. So, um, but so during all of that, um, I've made four short films, and uh, the most recent one is is called Peggy, and it's a um, it's a kind of half uh, praise song, half sardonic look at the American housewife, and and, um, and and I think it's subtitled the age of coveting or the the art of coveting in the age of social media. So it's a, it's kind of under the surface about appearances and. Um, and our inability to keep up with them, especially with this kind of constant comparison tool that we have. I really enjoyed it. And the thing that I really connected with was as a female, females can be quite competitive, competitively comparative with one another. Hmm. And <laughs> I feel like you nailed that in a, in a judgmental way, which is like, not great. You're gluten-free or sugar-free like you want to be the best version of that and right. it's like if you're not oh you're not that way <laughs> right mm. and then it's even worse yeah when they actually pull it off which i think is kind of what the what the peggy like idol is you know is that it's just like it's like yeah this gross cake with all these like random like you know gross sounding ingredients but it still tastes delicious like that's the ultimate injury kind of and yeah, I mean, that was like, so, so that thing, you know, it's, it re I really should probably have put my wife on the, the bill as a, as a co-writer. I think that I was like, you know, I don't know what I was just didn't maybe like, you know, she never like typed the words, but like she totally co-wrote it in retrospect. And so we are working right now, like on a, on a feature, um, kind of exploration into that same world it's just a feature adaptation of Peggy though I think it'll be kind of um content wise a completely different thing but her insight was like you know beyond valuable and she got a little uh part in it too um I don't know if you recognize her um in it she was like the redhead in the band with the little girl and uh oh, so right. she got she got a pretty like fun little role in it and um and it was really fun to work with um her on it and yeah it ultimately like came about from a conversation with with uh my sister and her um and my buddy jeremiah and um we were just hanging out one night and and the the name peggy just like came blurting out from somebody's mouth and we we're like oh man that's the perfect name for whoever this person is that's just like come on i can't believe that um you're pulling all this off you know and 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 it was like this type of, uh, you know, like it's hard enough to just like survive in the world. And then there's people who seem to do it just gracefully and at least on the surface and on the outward appearance. And you, 
you know it's not like true really it's deep down you know that it can't be like that perfect but like they you know they have yeah they somehow have like these these well-mannered kids and that you know that say yes ma'am and you know they still look great even though they've had five kids and like you know all all these things and then and then somehow they also have time to like blog about it and that was kind of the you know that that was the idea behind peggy was was a uh, from through the lens of social media in particular which is why the whole thing kind of the whole short emulated a pinterest party you know it's like a birthday party that you researched all the cutest little things to do on on pinterest and and uh and that was kind of the thing that we were exploring there through the lens of social media which i think just really lets you see the gloss and like yeah you don't see the stuff behind the scenes so Absolutely. And it's gotten into a ton of festivals. Have you been able to attend most of them? And, you know, so what, what has been some of the feedback and conversations you've had there? Yeah, it got into like 75 festivals and it, and it did really, really well. And I think that I learned a lot about the festival circuit um, on that because I, I definitely did not get to go to all of them, unfortunately. Um, I would say like maybe a dozen of those or so I was not able to because of COVID, like it kind of was, it was the, it was definitely the tail end of the festival schedule, but it was, um, you know, like preventing me from getting to a handful of them, especially here in California, for some reason, there were like a few in the, in, the, in those months there um, with COVID and they just kind of got turned into digital, like online festivals. But um, yeah, the first one that I went to, it basically had its world premiere at, um, at, the uh, Calgary International Film Festival. And um, there I met this like really cool guy. I think, um, you know, I, I think he kind of like handpicked the short um, or he was like one of a couple people who was like, hey, this, we want this short to be in it. And um, they were so cool to me. And the, the whole festival was really great. And he really almost like took me under his wing and helped me understand, I think like what is okay and, and not when you're approaching festivals and when you're trying to find the right festivals and and how to reach out to you know programming directors and and everything at these festivals and um so uh his name's brennan tilly and i really really uh like him a lot and consider him a friend now and and uh credit him with a lot of peggy's festival success but yeah so from there we went on you know and we we got into i think eight you know, academy qualifying festivals and, and, um, and it, I mean, I think that it was, I think that even then, I, it has to be even more true now, but even then I think people were just like craving for comedy and this in particular, this kind of cathartic comedy that Peggy is where it's like, you're, you're like laughing at Peggy, you know, the short and at Peggy, the character, but you're also kind of laughing at yourself a little bit and, and, um, you know, things like, like, so the social dilemma just came out, right? And like, I think that we were all like sensing some of that without knowing how to, how to put it into words. And I think that things like, you know, I think that's what comedy is in a lot of ways is, is us being able to loosen up and, and laugh at ourselves. Like it's it, like comedy that's mean, isn't like funny. And so typically like you go, and that's why, so like Jim Gaffigan, when like his comedy is that he goes to like a place and then he makes fun of that place in front of all the people from that place, you know, and they like, they all lose it cause they get the jokes, but they also um, are like, you know, trying to laugh through like the more uh, kind of awkward parts of their existence that they, that they haven't fully figured out like what's wrong with them or like, well, you know, there, but there's something weird here. And so there's somebody really smart and observant that comes through and, and helps you laugh at it. So I think that that's um, in large part why it, why it did well at a lot of the festivals. And it really was like a, it's, it's fun to watch, I think on a screen, like by yourself. And I think like, you know, you know, people will be like, man, I, I laughed out loud at this part. Like, which, you know, like I don't do a lot, like when I'm just watching something by myself, but like watching it with an audience was out of control. It was really, really fun. When there was like a packed audience, I mean, it would like people would just be screaming and like, I mean, it felt like, yeah, it felt like a real riot. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. 
That that is so rewarding. Uh, being in a theater, uh, seeing your film go, and then hearing the audience reaction. Like, I don't know how you feel, but I know I get like so nervous. And then, oh, yeah. then as soon as like there's a reaction, I'm like, oh, okay. oh yeah, <laughs> oh man, yeah. I remember I remember getting yeah that like sick feeling in my stomach when I was when I was watching it, just like the cast and crew screening kind of, which we did with a a group of friends. Um, there was like four shorts total. And so, so it started out and it's kind of a bit of a slow burn and it like that Peggy is in particular and teaches you, I think kind of the jokes and there's kind of a lot of setup in the beginning. Like the first scene is not really funny, hardly at all. It's like kind of like, okay, yeah, this is like interesting and clever kind of, but it's, it's just pure setup. So it's like halfway through before it really starts to ramp up. And then I think it kind of goes like, it starts exponentially kind of ramping up. But halfway through that first viewing, I was like, oh no, like nothing works. Like, you know, it's just like kind of, kind of quiet in the audience. And then it, and then finally like it clicked and yeah, like everybody started having fun with it. Uh, before we move on, I want to talk real quick, whatever you're willing to share about uh, what you learned um, while submitting to film festivals because I know like I've read a lot of articles and a lot of research and I still get a little bit lost in that process sometimes yeah. and yeah definitely um and I do too so I mean the I I try to I first of all try to really like track things pretty well from short to short and like you know on a project that like helps me you know, because I mean, I just get lost. I go, oh, yeah, I already submitted to that one. You know, I think there was one or two festivals where I submitted twice. And I was like, you know, oh, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's like, oh, OK, sorry. At least just please don't disqualify me. At least it was a mistake. You know, like, I don't even really like I don't think I even asked for the money back. But I was just like, please don't disqualify me. <laughs> it was an accident. And because, um, yeah, it just like it just gets so crazy. And then and finding the time to do it. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I'm submitting to this one. I might as well just go ahead and submit to these other few here and and it gets crazy but the i think the big thing that really um man one of the big hints that brennan gave me that i really appreciated was was he was like all right so mo most of the like bigger festivals and the real festivals they have an archive of the of the things that have played at least for the past few years on on the website right so it's like you can go back and look at the 2019 schedule and so when i was in and, and it always kind of works this way a little bit, but in in Calgary, I was playing alongside a bunch of shorts that had that had played, I think, at Sundance the the previous year, and at maybe Palm Springs Short Fest and stuff. And these places where people go, like festival programmers, go to these other festivals to find what they want to program, and that you know the what you always want to hear from like kind of a submitter is that a festival has a really high rate of, um, of submission, uh, admissions. That's not the right word, but like that, because, because a lot of them, not a lot, but, but, um, even really big festivals, they do, um, especially ones that aren't, I think like South by Southwest, Tribeca, Sundance, stuff like that, that really lean heavily on the premiere status of a film. Um, but that they want, they, you know, cause most of the festivals, they know kind of like the audience that they cater to in their community. And, and they're like, man, they really love comedies, but we don't get a whole lot of comedy submitted to us or at least a whole lot of good ones. So I'm going to look for some good comedies when I go to Sundance and I go, and I particularly try to watch the, the, the comedies blocks or whatever, you know? So long story short, like mine the archive for like the previous years especially when you when you get into like a festival and it's like oh man this was a good block of films or i know that this film this other film that i was screening with did really well it's like you email that programming director or you know in particular probably the shorts programming director because they're often different people tell them why you you know um have been attracted to their festival like either i've known about you forever or like man i love your city and like i'm you know i love the types of blocks that you guys seem to put together and also you know i i just screened with with this short you know that i see you you programmed last year and it um 
you know, and it seemed like our films paired really well together in the block and, and like basically something that context, like if you're just going to send out a blanket kind of um, mass email or cover letter, apparently, and not a lot of people read the cover letters that you kind of like put into I was film freeway and stuff. That. I mean, I, I doubt that it's like that they don't read them, but I think it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, like I see that they made a cover letter and it's nice, but, but I think when you get, I think when they get an email, um, it, and, and there's screen grabs and a list of some other festivals that you've, you know, been accepted to, or that you maybe are like, you know, that have reached out to you or something like that. Um, you know, the, the types of festivals that your previous shorts have been into stuff like that. I think that it, um, just clicks a little bit better. I th I'm almost sure it's because of the images. Like, I think that if like, so, if a poster and some screen grabs pop up that are like, interesting then i think that they give that you know just contextualize it a little bit better so i um that i felt like was a huge piece of advice that i really used a lot and i and i looked at um there was like a, there was a short called worm and there was a short one of the ones nominated for academy award called fav valve um that that i that i screened with and uh so I would look at that, you know, I would also look at their, like, you know, you would go to their short film website, which would have a list of all of the, all the festivals that they'd been accepted to so far. So then you could go, oh, okay, well maybe I'll submit to, to these or see what it's like or whether I've missed the deadline or whatever. So that started to drive like a lot of my festival strategy from there out. And I think that it's probably a completely different thing when we get to features. It's like, man, there is no end to the, amount of new things you have to learn to succeed in this it's like all right i figured out how to make movies and it's like man you're not even you're not even halfway there like you gotta yeah you gotta I figure agree. out how to game the festival system and now i've got to figure out how to game the kind of agent manager thing and like man it's a long road of like starting over and uh <laughs> learning from the you know from zero but yeah but that's that's kind of like i think um been, that was a big part of my festival strategy for Peggy. And I think it paid off pretty well. Like, you know, I, I kind of like find, I found festivals that I thought it had a shot at and I tried reaching out to people about it. And, um, and then I would also ask, you know, it's like when I would go to the festivals, I would, even though I'm, I'm kind of introverted in a lot of ways. Like I, I mean, I really have to force myself. I, I just really started like forcing myself to stick my hand out and say, Hey, I'm Justin and just get it over with just to random people. And, you know, it's like, sometimes it was weird and sometimes it wasn't. And, and I'm, but I met a lot of cool people that way. And, and um, so it's, I really have to kind of like put that, that cloak on, but um, it was like, I was meeting people and then trying to get, you know, contacts from them as well. It's like, do you know any other festival programmers that you think would maybe, that you, you know, some that you could recommend that, some other festivals that might like it. And they'd be like, Oh, you should submit to these and these and these. And so I would. And then, and then sometimes they would have contacts at those places too. And I would just follow up and be like, you have anybody I should check in with on these. And so it's like, I guess I was surprised to learn that it's this much, you know, in this kind of weird, like, okay, I'm on film freeway and I'm just like clicking some things and typing some things and hitting submit. And I guess I'll hope for the best. It's like, apparently it's much more inter, personal than that which was on one hand like a relief to learn and on the other hand it's like man yeah like how did I not know this like that would have been nice to know because like yeah and thank you that, for sharing I had yeah. I'm yeah. learning a lot I had <laughs> yeah <no idea>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that I mean it, it was it was cool to learn that and, that and that's like that's a lot of the same game I'm still learning right is it's with this an right. agent manager stuff it's like it's like can't just like email people and then like assume that they're gonna kind of like follow up on it because they might be like oh man yeah this is a, this is a cool email i'm gonna follow up on it tomorrow and then you know exactly what it's like to have that list of things and just never be able to get to it and so it's like you know you gotta keep emailing and you gotta call and like you know that i think that you like them hearing a human voice whether or not like it, it's even kind of a conscious thing like it's just different from getting emails and hearing somebody that's excited and motivated and all that is like, uh, you know, I think does it, it does a lot more probably even than the email and how like well composed your pitch deck is. So definitely, yeah. I don't know how you feel about this, but for me, I feel like 
I'm either really on or really off in person. And I like the, the as a writer and, and also just as an email and emailer and picture of like, I like being able to slow down and really take the time with my words and say exactly what I want via email or pitch deck. But in person, it's like, it's either a head or yeah. a head. No, I am for sure. I, I, I suffer from, I mean, there must be some psychological uh, term for this, but I really struggle with like doing anything the same way twice. I don't know what it is, but I mean, it's really like, if you were to ask me today, like what the log line is for the feature that I'm writing, I would like, I'd be like searching through words to find it. And then if you asked me it tomorrow, I wouldn't like use any of the same words or something. I mean, I would some of the same words, but it's like, I'm, I, I have a hard time. Um, yeah, just like I totally should be able to carve out the right words and then use them over and over because it's not like, it's not like there's a whole new set of meaning coming out of me trying to figure it out on the fly each time. But yeah, I, I, uh, I think that that's why that happens for me is like, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I nailed that. That's exactly what that feature is that I'm writing right now. And other times I'm like, why didn't I say the thing that I said before that it was, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know. Like, I, I think that I've been working on that a little bit too, because I know that in the, in the actual pitching process, it's like, you basically have to have a, you know, a script and you're like delivering a script and you have to make it not feel that way, but it's like, you gotta, um, like you don't, you don't have a bunch of time to fumble through it and like hopefully get it right. It's like, you gotta get it right every time that you're meeting with them and then, and then wait for the right person who's excited for it. Cause, cause it's like some people will read your stuff and, and they'll love it. And then other people will be like, yeah, it's not for me. You know? And it's like, well, got to get used to that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely got to grow uh, tough skin fast in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just across the board, but I think it becomes harder when you're writer, director or director and in some elements producer, like I feel like, you know, the industry's changed that you almost have to wear a lot of hats because since there is so much content being produced, there are more opportunities, but I find it's with everything shifting. And like you said, like there's just a big rabbit hole constantly to like learn something new. And mm. it's like, how do you keep up with it? And um, yeah. And, and, you know, especially from like the distribution perspective where we're both looking to make the, you know, jump to, you know, feature land of, mm. uh, you know, we, I'm sure you hear too, we hear over and over again, like you already have to have an established audience. You have to have proof in some way that mm. people are going to care about this film. And um, I've also been reading, you know, you got to be like taking the bull by the horns with your marketing. And so like, I've been learning marketing and it's just like, yeah. I would much, and that's the thing that's tough. It's like, how do you balance your time between like, learning how to be the best director you can be, learning how to be the best mm -hmm. writer you can be. And then like the world and the industry is telling you, you gotta know all these other things as well. And it's just like, oh God. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't sorted that out very well yet. I mean, I think that the, um, I think that there are, and I would kind of be happy to just take like the, the writer route or the director route or the producer route. Like at this point, if it was like, you know, if it was something that just kind of, I think got me into the, um, you know, into the real kind of like content creation game some, cause I think that I, um, I, I think that I'm a, uh, I think that I am a very good director. I haven't had as much experience now doing that as I have writing. Um, and, you know, and I do think that I'm like a very kind of personable and organized producer and very kind of like budget conscious, but at the same time too, it's like, it's like, well, that's a whole other, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I don't really know those tracks very well. And I think that must, I think the problem is that a lot of the, like my heroes are writer directors, if not writers, director producers. So it's like you, I think you look at them and, and, uh, and you kind of, you know, and then you're like, okay, well, I'm going to try to make a movie like one of these movies that are like one of my favorite movies of all time. 
And it's like, but man, that's like a hard thing to just jump into. And it's, it's probably even just a harder thing to convince other people that, that you're able to jump into it than it would, I feel like, than it would be to actually do it. But it's, uh, you know, so a lot of it's about convincing people and mitigating risk, right? Like, I think that that's, man, that's like been the topic of conversation a lot around our household lately, because it's, I mean, us as a nation right now are having a hell of a time figuring out how to mitigate risk, right? Like with this whole COVID thing. And it's like, how do we, how do we weigh the risk of, uh, you know, some, some knowns about what this virus is versus the unknowns of like the mental health, you know, implications and like what's going to happen to kids if they can't, like if they basically miss two years of school, like the, you know, this online school stuff is uh, everybody's trying, but it's not, great and um so so in the film industry it's like um us trying to figure out at, at, at some level every one of these things like even um, even if it's a micro budget indie it's us trying to figure out how to convince people that the risk is low and and it's like you know me coming out of the gate and wanting 15 million dollars for a movie is like, well, whoa, I know you made this little short that did well and, you know, kudos, but like that doesn't really translate exactly into this big thing. So, so now what? And it's like, well, more shorts or maybe a micro budget feature that like, you know, is where the risk is much lower. And so, you know, I think, I think I keep hoping that there's going to be somebody who like grapples on and it's just like, man, I like what you're up to. I, I want to give you a shot. And at some point that's going to happen, but I, I think it's, you know, been kind of like a constant onion peeling back of uh, realizing that it's really just me um, kind of taking, I think, more reasonably approachable steps toward the stuff that I've kind of always wanted to make, you know? So it's like, it's a catch 22 a little bit because it's, you you want to make these movies, but you can't make those movies until you've made some other movies that are maybe not the movies you wanted to make all that much. So how do you still make those great? Well, that's interesting. So, you know, during COVID, there's been a lot of opportunities to do like socially distanced content creation, like Zoom plays and stuff. And I don't know about you, but I was just like, Man, I, for me anyway, in the stories that I want to tell, I was like, I can't think of a story that I really want to tell where it's just like squares on the screen with people talking. And, you know, I feel like it's, it's you know, relatable and like, you know, you have these big concept ideas and it's like, it's, it just goes back to like paying your dues. And in, in this industry, it can feel like such a grind and uphill battle. And it's like, you, you get these steps like uh you know for both of us we've done very well for our careers as like below the line crew which a lot of people are just like can be astounded over but it's just like and i don't know if you're like this but for me i'm like yeah yeah but i'm just like that's not what i want to do <laughs> like, and yeah it's it's tough because um yeah it's it's like when when do i get you have to like you have to have so many full careers before you get to what you actually want to do and that's just it's exhausting mm -hmm. you know um but with that you know i you know it's like still got the eye on the prize eye on the target of mm -hmm. like i really want to make these movies make these stories you know but yeah. uh yeah, yeah i think I hear that's you. And, true yeah. And one thing too that, you know, I want to add, ask you about like, you know, I'm single, but you have a very full family. Like how do you balance that? And you say that, you know, you and Mindy uh, co-write, like um, how do you guys balance finding the time and having, you know, the cash flow that you guys need to support your family um, while, you know, taking jobs for art direction or, deciding to take, I don't know if you consciously decide to take breaks with writing and directing. I know I do, but I can, I'm a little bit more flexible in that way where <laughs> it's only me that I have to take care of. Yeah. Um, well, I clearly haven't like figured it out all that well so far, but, um, 
there's yeah and and there's a certain acceptance what yeah you know and gladly like i've kind of uh been happy i guess to kind of take a slow burn um you know yeah compromise approach to to my career where yeah i mean it's like if i didn't have four kids it would be a lot easier for me to kind of just go off and like and and you know because a, a lot of what that that risk mitigation conversation is from earlier is that it's like okay well especially when you're young and and uh and fresh and hungry and everything like you can kind of go out and you can just go out and make something and the risk isn't all that much you can go spend six months on it and and like just you know live cheaply and not have to worry too much about yeah your your kids and feeding all these extra mouths and stuff and it's and and uh like the you know the blessing of having the kids like for me you know, is certainly outweighs whatever kind of like exhausting slow burn approach it is i am taking here but cuz it ultimately i think the answer is like i just kind of always try to prioritize them and and the that's like a very um lame thing to say like when i think about it because it's totally not really true but like that's like what I, that's what we try to do is is uh you know because I, I feel like i'm often um working at night when i should be like you know tucking them into bed and reading to them and stuff like that and and um and, and you know or i'm or there was so when i was working on tenant um and the six months prior where I, basically from the time that i was i was working on the outsider through the end of tenant was the bulk of the festival circuit for me. And I, I think probably every other weekend I was flying away to a film festival and that, and then I flew to California for work for, you know, a, for quite a long time and was working away from them, you know, to, to move to, to LA. And, uh, and it's like, yeah, that, so clearly I'm not exactly prioritizing them, but I, because it's like, well, if, if I was, then we would stay in Atlanta or maybe even go somewhere a little bit more quaint than that and, and all that. But, 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 you know, I think that there's, yeah, there's ultimately there's just something kind of like inside me that compels me to do this that I kind of can't ignore. And so I, I think that everybody knows it's, um, it's kind of a, a, a major goal of mine to do we'll all find out later on whether or not it was, um, whether it was meaningful or not and whether it was worth it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think a lot of it is, is me, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, like not getting to spend much time with friends unless it's us working on stuff together, which is like, I mean, we all love those, you know, that, that the occasion to do that, but, but, you know, unfortunately, I think my friends have to realize that, like, I love them, even though I don't really, because it's like, well, it's work and family, pretty much, you know, there's like only so many hours, I can't sleep in the night. And, um, and I think everybody knows that for the most part. And I just try to, yeah, give, you know, whether it's my kids or my friends or my family, or whatever, I just try to give them the time that I can. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. The other thing, unfortunately, that we don't do, um, at least when it's not uh when we're not under quarantine is like watch anything anymore it's like i got into movies to because i loved watching movies i think and, but it's like we don't watch anything anymore because we're just like so busy uh working on them and trying to make our own and yeah just doing stuff with school you know like i think after this call i'm gonna go help me figure out how to do fractions i don't know it's just one day at a time and like one you know kind of like dream after another that gets replaced by reality but it's one of those things where it's like well maybe if i you know hadn't had my kids my career would be farther along but like maybe not too i don't know so yeah because i will say there's different challenges like mm -hmm. you know what you face versus i face are, are just different um yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> well i mean one thing and i mean like i this is probably not the challenge you're talking about exactly but like I mean, the one thing that I don't have to do is spend any energy on like trying to find somebody to hang out with me because they're always right here. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like, uh, I like, you know, my, my favorite single friends, it's like, man, like, you ha like, it's just so much 
energy and and like and and I'm so grateful that I don't have to do that so so and not that it's a bad thing but it's like <laughs> you know but it, but it's like okay I don't you know it's like I just don't have to expend energy on that so and like you're saying I think it's a bit of a trade off but um yeah but yes, and, I mean, four four kids is is a lot of a lot of balls to juggle. But you know, they're we're also super lucky because they're they're all um, kind and uh, and they all like get it. I think you know, like they'll they'll try to sneak in here and and then Mindy will yell at them and <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But it's uh it's generally a joy to to be with them. So that makes it pretty easy. Yeah. No, you guys have such a sweet family for sure. I remember on trial by fire when they came to visit and it was like, it's like this endless train. Oh man. I just kept coming it was through. So cute. Yeah, there's there I have a few um yeah, I have a few like kind of visual yeah, it's like like they're on loop or something almost, you know. I think I think I was I think I was on Las Vegas and John Turtletop, who I really loved, like um like I just really enjoyed him a lot he was hilarious but yeah you know it's like it just so happened like Mindy's like you know kind of like excited when people when like famous people are around but also like oh I can't believe you know that we like that that we walked in right then when John Turtletop was there whatever but you know he was just like oh my god you know just like <laughs> and, th and then like another one would come in and he'd be like what you know oh, it's like funny. just got something out of a Steve Martin movie or yeah, yeah yeah so our life is definitely there's a lot to laugh at and that's where i think a lot of yeah you know this kind of peggy type stuff comes from is a lot of it's like just observing people over time and trying to put some kind of caricatured pieces of them together into something that's meaningful you know it's interesting that you say that like my writing process like I'm such a big people observer, people watcher. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me a long time to really identify as a writer, like, mm. and also just to like go into my family dynamic a little bit. My sister went to school uh, for English and she was like deemed the writer in the family. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting into it and we co-wrote my last short, Dig Your Grave together. But then, you know, I started branching off really in, I guess 2018, 2019, so relatively recently, but then I'm like, oh wait, no, I totally got this. Like, I'm not mm. saying I'm like the best writer ever, but it's like I started embracing and finding my confidence as writer and, and, and finding my voice. And um, uh, and then when I started identifying myself that way, people were like, oh, you must like love to read and be this big, big bookworm. And because I have glasses people just like make all these assumptions too oh man <laughs> I, yeah I, i'm just like that feels you know, like pretty antiquated yeah 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 i know oh you have um, glasses <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's so funny whenever i wear my glasses or not i get very different uh, like whenever someone makes it a, makes a comment about my appearance i get very different oh, that's reactions. interesting yeah it definitely uh, is um it's like but some yeah. low-key superhero uh alias stuff going on there <laughs> It is like a super. Yeah. yeah. Like what? Whoa. Who, who, where did Michelle just go? <laughs> yeah. But uh, so it's interesting. Like I find that I'm more inspired by life than I am. I don't want to say by books. Oh. There's Vera. <laughs> See, they pop in here. So Vera, hold on. Let me, I'll be out there in just a minute. Love you. <laughs> She's so big now. But yeah, so sorry, you just said, I think, yeah, books. Is that the last thing you said? You're inspired uh, by books? Yeah, sorry, as far sorry. as like where to find, you know, inspiration for writing is like, I definitely get inspired by life. And, uh, you know, going back to what you said earlier of like where you don't watch as much TV or film anymore, I find that I watch it more for intention of like, I want to write, like one of the things that I have kicking around in my head right now um, as my next screenplay is a 90s rom-com. So it's like, I've been going down the 90s rom-com yeah. rabbit hole. So it's like, I watch with intention so I can, you know, see, especially with that, where it's like, almost like an homage to like a period, mm -hmm. not period piece, but an era of like, yeah. those were like such the peak at the time. And uh, it's like, okay, what are the common tropes? What were some of the common 
type of characters and, mm -hmm. and then how do I, how can that, what's an interesting way for me to reframe it with today? Because yeah. of course, you know, there's the dialogue of like, oh, they got this wrong and that's yeah. so socially offensive now or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, keep in mind the times and I'm sure people will say that about, you know, the films now and, and that's yeah. another thing too, even with like doing this like vlog, uh, there hasn't been a ton of haters out there, but they've started to like show up and I'm like, all right, this is just gonna be, you know, part yeah. of it as a filmmaker, you know? Yeah, um, no, it's this probably is, like, a good lesson a low... to learn right now. Huh? It's probably a good lesson to learn right now, yeah. And just Absolutely. to like not read the comments or whatever the thing is, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's like whatever the celebrity is, just, or, you know, don't read the reviews don't Google yourself. Like, <laughs> yeah, don't read the comments. Like, man, I don't know. It's, it is pretty gnarly out there. I think, uh, for a lot of reasons, but, um, but yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully you won't get too many haters. Well, and like I said, the platform is like, you know, relatively small and I'm not as emotionally attached to, you know, right. my kind of educational work, but for my films, I'm going to be very attached. To yes, those. yes, yes. So I'm just like, <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, I read, I mean like, so Peggy got like kind of, you know, enough traction that it, um, that it, you know, there's maybe like a dozen reviews of it, like by people who, I mean, not, it's not like, deadline reviewed it or anything but like um you know it's like people who will go to festivals and then they'll they'll review the short films and stuff like that on them and like some of them yeah are great and it's like this is great you know and then that some other ones are like you know it's like yeah whatever i don't know there's no there's no texture or no there's no pacing or whatever and you're like what yeah yeah there is you know it's like what do you you even just something that simple where it's like i don't think anybody came out and just said like they hated it but um but yeah, it's like, and you don't know who these people are. It's like, why do I, yeah, it's like, I mean, I want people to like it, but it's like, yeah, you got to stay away from, from that stuff. Cause it's, it's, yeah, the bigger you get, the more it's going to be out there. Right. It's like, absolutely. Yeah. And, and people are so bold online versus how they are in person. Like, you know, like yeah. the, the inner part of me is like, tell that to my family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they won't. No, no, they won't. Yeah. I don't know. We should just disable comments on the internet in general or something <laughs> so gnarly out there I yeah i don't know hopefully we'll figure out how to get a little bit better at it so how did you get your start in film and you mentioned that uh you got your i forget sorry explain what you got your degree in in architecture yeah so yeah and 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 basically i i um kind of practiced architecture for a few years right out of college and then um and then the recession hit in like 2008 and I think it was like late 2009 that I got let go it was actually like way you know I think I was kind of like looking around like and we were we were kind of staying busy but it was like you know that this was a pretty kind of like high profile like competition kind of based architecture firm and so it's like okay you put you know you keep busy with um your submissions to a lot of these competitions but then you win some and then you and then you go and do some stuff but because of the recession like there just weren't as many competitions and then so it was like kind of like starting to be like okay well we're doing competitions but we're not starting any new projects it finally um happened and it wasn't really a huge surprise to me so i just kind of threw myself at a short film which i had never really done before um and i like i just i knew that i wanted to make film but I just kind of like didn't know what was up so I made this kind of Flannery O'Connor like uh Kubrickian um yeah like kind of southern gothic gothic uh short about a first date called a lady can live through anything it's just like a really bad first date about this you know the guy's kind of like the guy really likes the girl and all of his friends are like, if you really want her to like you, like you just have to treat her like garbage because it works every time kind of thing. So it's just kind of like a real shady look at uh, love dynamics or something. Um, and I think it was kind of sweet and kind of fun, but, and it like got into some regional festivals. So I went to some of those regional festivals and uh, in part to just kind of research, I think it was the Macon Film Festival. I met a local filmmaker there. Did, uh, I basically went to the Macon Film Festival and met a local filmmaker there who gave me some names. And 
And the like one piece of advice that I have for people is, is that if you call somebody, they're not going to have work for you right there and just tell you to come on over and do, and you know, yeah, come on over and start on work. And, um, so, so when they say they don't have work, just ask them for a couple names and call those people and then ask them for a couple names. And then like, eventually you'll run into somebody that, that, you know, will probably not even, it'll probably be somebody that calls you back. It probably won't even be a, yeah, come on over. So that ended up me talking to Doug Thick, I think, who you know, don't you? That, you know Doug Thick, don't you? He's an art director in, in Atlanta, in the Atlanta scene. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if we've met, but I definitely know the name. Okay, he's like the sweetest man. Yeah. yeah, and he got he basically got me in uh, somehow with Mark Garner on Big Mama's House Three, and so that was my first movie. And um, and my uh, architecture portfolio type thing basically allowed me to just start set designing, um, like not knowing anything. I didn't even really know that I would be using AutoCAD to do stuff. I don't know what I thought the art department process was like, but it's like, obviously there has to be some people telling everybody else how to build something, like how to put things together and you need drawings for that. And it's like, I had been make, I'd been doing drawings um, and 3D modeling and building models and all kinds of stuff like that um, at the architecture firm. So, even though I didn't um, PA, I guess I have to justify it by saying that like maybe I kind of did that at the architecture firm. So it, it was like kind of a, a pretty amazing like entry into into the into the industry and and you know it's like I had been working for like three years on one building and I think five years later it finally like that you know they cut the ribbon on it but it was like I drew something on a Friday and I came in on Monday and it was like starting to already stand up and I was like, this is crazy. So, um, so from there, um, I, you know, as the timing was kind of incredible because it was right when film was starting to move to Atlanta and, and the, the short film that I did, um, you know, kind of like, kind of got me the ability you know I met a few people and got to do a second one and and each one's gotten better than the last one I think and uh and so I've kind of just been able to kind of keep that going along in the background but the you know I think that there's been a like kind of a few important people in the whole process and a few kind of important jumps but for the most part it's just kind of been like a you know like an almost non-stop like um word of mouth type thing which is like just how it, it uh, it's like you're surprised i guess when you realize that as well that it's just like you know it's very little at some point you don't even get like interviewed hardly you just get a recommendation from somebody that you know you trust and they're like you have to get this person or whatever and so you're just like i'm like, hey are you available because i'll have the upm call you right now <laughs> that kind of thing absolutely and so that's, you know it's like it, it's amazing how um again like interpersonal the this industry is and and how much that counts and like that you know it amazes me when like jerks ever have a job in this industry because it's like i mean not only because they're jerks but also because it's like who, like who's who's giving this person recommendations who's like who's writing this person's name out you know it's like there's people who are just as good but aren't jerks so well, um, I have a theory behind that. For one thing, the work has exploded. So there's so yeah. like everyone will be working at some, when, when it, we're at the peak of how much work is in town. The other thing is if they only look at their resume alone and don't check references, it's like, oh, well, yeah. they've been working in this industry for years. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it certainly issue? happens. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah, but man, there's for the most part, you know, I I remember um, I still love architecture, and I hope that I can kind of re-engage like on that side of design at some point too. Um, you know, I don't know what that would mean at this point, but like there's there's like really critical kind of uh, um, <laughs> like psychological like personality issues or something. I think with architects like beyond the the normal like i think that architects more than maybe any other group of people in the world just believe that if like 
only they were able to manage all the resources on the planet, then everything would just be perfect. You know, like that if they could, if they could just run everybody's lives, like everybody would be so much happier. Like that's that's like architects in a nutshell for me. And um, I think I like really kind of like went away from that and then was going into film and I was like, oh no, like I think I'm going to hate everybody in film. Like I think it's just going to be awful. But for the most part, I mean like 99% of it are, are like lovely people that have um, been very graceful to me and very generous to me. And um, you know, it's like crazy hard work. Um, but uh, but I think like, yeah, as long as you're kind of willing to put in the hard work and and stay positive and stay creative and and like ultimately I think whether you're writing or directing or art directing or art department coordinating or like creative problem solvers kind of. And I think that that's why um, it's because every single time you start a new project, it's a completely different set of problems to solve. I mean, there's a lot of the same tools kind of, but like you have to invent new ones all the time too. So, you know, and I think that the higher up you get, the, the more those, those problem, like creative problem solving skills are needed. Like, you know, it's like you need to be better and better at the higher you get, but um, ultimately it feels very similar. Like when I think back to that first short film that I made where I didn't know anything, and then I am like on the set of, you know, first man and tenant and stuff. And I'm like, sometimes it like, doesn't feel all that different. You know, like it's pretty much like the same yeah. crazy creative process, like for better and for worse. So, um, you know, it's like, ultimately, I don't know how much, I think, I'll, I think I still kind of like justify some of my art direction career with like thinking that it will somehow translate over to my writer director career. And I, I'm not, it will, I think, from the from the personal connections and relationships that I have with people, but it might be the only way that it really does. Like, I, I don't think anybody cares that I've worked on Tenet, and I don't think that has any, like, any bearing whatsoever on people's assessment of my risk and my ability to make a film. So it's like, you know, okay, I guess. I, I hear that. Going. Um, I think especially working in art department art department is so influential in the look of a film and it dictates so many other departments between like locations and wardrobe and props um i really like what we've been able to learn behind the scenes as far as like you know hearing the discussions between all the key mm. players and um i know if, like for me when i went to school uh, i didn't I was, I've always been exposed to the art scene, but never got a strong degree in anything particular in art. And like, so for my job, art department coordinator, um, clearances is a big part of it. So I almost mm -hmm. became like an art historian, like over mm -hmm. the years of just yeah. like recognizing, you know, what are certain uh, types of art? Like what is, what is that style called so that I can Try and narrow down the artist or right. a decade yeah. to try and clear that piece of art because uh you know decorators or buyers may find a piece of work that they love from a garage sale and then there's just like mm -hmm. this this really poor little signature right. at the bottom and yeah. so it's just like yeah piecing together all those details and then as far as how it helps with directing like the research aspect of it is really really great of mm -hmm. um going down all those rabbit holes of you know i'll use trying to think of a good example of like say you know i'm looking around my my room right now like say you know we're dressing a 20s 30s female in the 2020s it's like mm -hmm. okay what does that look like so you maybe go on to pinterest or like mm -hmm. people's social media and just like find the reference photos and that'll inspire the look of the set and then that also gets you into the mindset of the character though so mm -hmm. um i know with my writing and directing process i do a lot of research before like i mean like i was telling you with like the 90s rom-com like i'm researching before mm -hmm. i write anything like i have some ideas kicking around but they haven't fully you know planted their seeds yet yeah absolutely yeah and i mean i i do think that you know i think that i will be able to look back and especially 
you know, when I've, when I've directed a handful of features and I'm like reflecting on them and the influences and, and the things that I've learned. Cause I mean, it's like, I, you know, I do get to see like Edgar Wright work like firsthand and I get to see, you know, like I, like I've seen Damien Chazelle and Denis Villeneuve and, and um, yeah, you know, Edgar Wright and uh, you know, Chris Nolan, like I, like I've seen these guys work. And I know that I'm going, okay, I want, I want to do that. I don't want to do that. That's cool. I think that might've been too much or whatever. You know, it's like, I'm seeing the best directors in the world do their thing and figure out how I want to, how I want to emulate them or not. And, uh, and so that totally does, you're right, have direct um, <laughs> like influence on it. I do think though that I am surprised by how, um, little that matters in the like pitching funding process of things though. So I, I like, I do feel more and more confident, like, you know, the, about my ability um, and the more, you know, and the higher, it's like, you know, the bigger projects that you get on and the, the like kind of more um, senior your role is the closer you are to like the big creative decision processing and, and all of that. So it's, and, and it's like, yeah, you know, it's like, it, a lot of times I'm like, man, how are these like first time directors that don't seem like they've done hardly anything? Like, how are they, how are they navigating this whole thing? Cause I start thinking about like, Oh no, what about, you know, this thing and that thing. And I have like this really detailed understanding of how a whole movie is put together from all the different departments down to the, you know, down to the distribution. And, uh, and it's like amazes me when these first time directors knock it out of the park. Um, yes and no like when I hear the behind the scenes stories of the first time directors like it can be kind of messy and I mm. I do feel that you know this is one one way that the industry is evolving is like there's you there's me there's more people like us that are below the line crew that you know want to direct and it's like how do we how do we make that um almost like rebranding voiced and amplified it's like and then how do you navigate that because i don't know if you feel like this but like you know using an example when i was a set pa like it, it was always the rule of like approaching talent like keep it professional don't ask for photos don't ask for autographs i almost feel like that too is behind this uh b below the line crew of like do i talk to producers about like my other projects i mean i don't know like i think it also depends on your relationship with them but um yeah, yeah i just feel like it's a little risky it is and i think i think in general yeah i think there's like some versions of etiquette of that that are yeah i don't know how many like rules or anything like i would have to say i know that i have um i i look for like kind of yeah, and uh, because I think it, I think that they probably do get that like more often than they'd like, you know, like the like a producer kind of getting a, a soft pitch from somebody. So it's like for me, I have to really, I think, have um, a real in, like a sign almost that it's like, okay, I'd like. So so there is a, a a producer and now friend of mine from the Leisure Seeker. And I have a TV show um, about the Maccabean revolt, which is like this, it's intertestamental um, ancient Israel. It's basically Braveheart in ancient Israel. And, and uh, so I was like, you know, just, I was writing it, I think maybe right around that time. And, um, and I was like researching um, where movies that are set at all in kind of ancient Israel-ish like um, look halfway decent. And, and you know, it's like, well, obviously some of them are in Israel, but um, also in Italy and also in Morocco. And those were like the three kind of like three of the big filming places. So we were working with an Italian production company. So there's a ton of Italians running around and and um doves like basically is kind of there was their american liaison more or less and he's a moroccan jew and so this like italy israel morocco thing was like was like and 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 i think he he told me that 
because he was wearing um, a Star of David. And I think like I, I mentioned, or I like asked him about it or something. And I was like, okay, well, that's super weird, but I think I need to tell you about this project that I'm writing. And, you know, and I was like, it's kind of like Vikings, but it's about the Maccabean revolt. And he was like, you know, cause I th he initially was like, okay, like, and I think he liked me just fine and everything, but it, you know, it's like, okay, here's somebody like pitching their project. And he was like, and then he was like, oh, he's like, okay, make that script super good and send it to me. And so I did. And, and like, you know, and we've, he's helped me pitch it to the co-head of television at CAA and stuff. So it's like, there, it, I don't know if there's any real rules, except it's like, you know, probably don't do it right at the beginning of the show because like, if you if you mess up or something, you don't want to completely burn that bridge forever and be like, oh, that's the guy who you know, <laughs> did that. It's like, but they might not remember that if you didn't like kind of already pitch your, your project to them. And then, uh, and then, yeah, just like kind of make it be a thing where it's like, look, I can't help, but like, I apparently I have to tell you about this right now. Um, and you know, no pressure, but that's, that's a weird coincidence kind of thing. And then, and then I think afterwards too, as long as you've had that kind of professional relationship, even if they don't know that you want to be a writer producer and you, you reach out to them afterwards with a phone call or an email, probably an email, like maybe with a follow-up phone call, if it seems warranted that says like, man, I, you know, I really appreciate it. Like I also typically only approach producers that I really appreciated. <laughs> So I've really appreciated working with you. Um, uh, you know, I, I am developing this project. Here's the pitch deck. Let me know if you, um, if, if you have any advice for me or can, or, you know, know anybody else who might be interested kind of thing. That feels like a pretty nice way to ask people if they're interested to, to ask if they know somebody who is interested, like to not yeah. put any, like, yeah. To, to not put any pressure on them to say I'm not interested, right? So, yeah. Um, and a good way, I think, to ask for money too, which I'm also terrible at. That's like <laughs> probably the thing I'm worst at in the world. I really don't like doing that, but yeah. one day I'll find somebody who will do it for me and it'll be great. That is my dream too. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I just want to find like the perfect producer that can like. Handle. Yeah, it's just like, how much money do you need? And I'm like, oh, all of it. And then they're like, no problem. Let me go get right. that for you. <laughs> and who also doesn't get in, in the middle of like, that doesn't say that your ideas are dumb. Like the producer who thinks all your ideas are fantastic and they'll just get you all the money, no problem. You know, until that day, we'll just keep figuring out in the meantime. Yep. Wearing all the hats. Going yeah. down all the rabbit holes. Yeah. Yeah, can you even see me with all the hats I'm wearing? Oh, I don't know. I know. I'm, un I'm under here. Nobody ever feels like they're there, I don't think. And when I when uh, Peggy got into, tr into Tribeca last year, I got to see Apocalypse Now, which is my favorite film, um, uh, screened with these like massive subwoofers that like make make the whole building shake and stuff. And Coppola was there, and and one of the things he talked about was that like. I mean, and I knew that nobody, like, I knew that nobody really wanted to make the movie, but the the way he framed it, you know, was just kind of, I never had really heard it expounded on this much, but it was like, all right, like, I had just made The Godfather, and maybe The Godfather 2 or something, and he had, like, four Oscars. He was, like, you know, on top of his game. Like, you would think people would be like, what, do you, what are you going to do? Like, I want in, I, whatever it is. And everybody in town turned him down on Apocalypse Now. And um, he ended up uh, like basically raising the money himself, I think, and mortgaging his, you know, vineyard or whatever it was. And it was like, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, you got a bunch of resources and tools now, but it's like, still he's got, he's, yeah, it's like, he's winning Oscars, made the Godfather, and he's still getting told no and has to just go out on his own and do it and prove to everybody that, that he was right. So it's like, okay, wow. I guess that's what we got to do. And it's like, it never stops, you know? <laughs> That's reassuring and then also not. This is yeah. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of risk and you got to believe in yourself, I think, which I maybe I'm not all, also always good at, but we're getting, we're going to get there. I feel that. One way or another. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, thank you again, Justin. Uh, this was a fantastic conversation and I definitely want to get into more art directing stuff, but this was like so great for writing and directing and like, you know, the emer emotional kind of turmoil and like, how do you find your confidence as you're finding your voice and trying to gain that experience? Like, it's a journey. So yeah. I really liked what you had to share too. And thank you for, you know, your, uh, what you shared on the film festivals. That was really, really helpful. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. Um, thank you for having me. It was a treat.